Good morning, my awesome accounting students. Welcome back to the second half of chapter 13. In the rest of this video, we'll talk about the remainder of the accounting cycle. We'll learn that although we've entered the adjustments into the worksheet, they still need to be journalized and posted. We'll talk about the, pro the closing process and what takes place and then we'll talk about the interpretation of some financial data as we talk about different ratios. We got a lot to cover. Let's get started. In the last chapter, we learned about all kinds of adjusting journal entries. They're summarized on this page. Remember that the worksheet was the internal tool that we used to drop in the adjustment data and to give the owner a preview of the financial statements. In this chapter, we've learned how to create the formal financial statements. And so now the last part of the adjustment process is to journalize and post these in the journal and then post to the general ledger. Just as we learned at the end of chapter six, Closing journal entries are necessary on the last day of the fiscal year. At the end of the period, we need to close the temporary accounts. The temporary accounts are all the revenues, the expenses, the income summary, and the drawing. The only difference now is we have a new set of accounts for a merchandiser and we also had quite a few contra accounts as well. So the steps will change a little bit. On the slide are the list of the steps. First, we'll close the revenue accounts and cost of goods sold accounts with credit balances. I think an easier way to remember this is to close the income statement accounts that have credit balances. Next, we'll close the income statement accounts that have debit balances. Number three, we'll still close the income summary to the capital account, but now the income summary has some beginning existing balances from the inventory adjustment that we looked at in the previous chapter. So we will have to be careful about that. And then just as before, will close the drawing. Let's take a look at these steps in more detail. Because we have a lot of merchandising accounts that have credit balances, it's no longer adequate to remember this journal entry as just close the revenues. That's what we did for a service oriented firm. So now we need to think about this first closing journal entry in a different sense. As it shows on the slide, in this journal entry, we will close out the income statement accounts that have credit balances. As always, closing is a game of opposites. We will debit individually each one of those accounts and have one big credit to income summary. This is the slide from the company that's in your textbook and this shows how the first closing journal entry would be placed in the journal. The second closing entry is to close out the income statement accounts with debit balances. Again, closing is a game of opposites, so save a placeholder for income summary in the debit column, but go through and individually credit every income statement account that has a debit balance. In other words, wipe them out. One large debit to income summary would be made for the sum of these totals. Just like we learned last time, the third closing entry closes out income summary. And the amount in the income summary is still equal to net income or possibly loss. Don't forget, however, that there is an existing debit and credit in the income summary account that wasn't there before. This resulted from the adjusting journal entries that we learned in the last chapter. 
However, even when those items are considered, foot the T account and you'll notice that it still balances to net income. So just like we did in the service firm, our entry to close out the income summary includes a debit to income summary and a credit to capital. This is the journal entry that occurs when the company has a net income. As you will remember from the previous chapter, if a loss exists, this journal entry would be flipped. The fourth closing entry is identical to what it was under the service-oriented firm. This fourth closing entry closes out the drawing. Since a drawing has a normal debit balance, the drawing account is credited with the offset or debit going to the capital account. Why? Because the drawing makes the capital account go down. And the way we transfer that is with a debit to the capital account. Let's revisit the reason that we made the closing entries in the first place. We basically did it for two reasons. To ensure that the nominal accounts or temporary accounts were wiped out so that they could start the new period at zero and we also did it to update the owner's capital account. Take a look at the slide. You'll notice that all the revenues are closed, all the expenses, including cost of goods sold, are closed. The capital account has now been updated for the net income and the withdrawal, and the withdrawal has been closed. So just as we did in Chapter 6, the last step in the closing process was to create a post-closing or after-closing trial balance. Let's take a look at what that would look like. You'll notice on the screen that just like before, the only things left are the assets, the liabilities, and the ending capital balance. Of course, the trial balance is bigger than before, simply for the reason that now we have a lot more accounts in our vocabulary. The last part of the chapter is devoted to interpreting the financial data. This is a little bit harder to do. In fact, I'm still learning every day. So some of the ratios that this chapter covers is the gross margin or gross profit percentage. This shows how much for each dollar in sales was generated for the gross profit. The net profit margin is similar, but it shows how much of each sales dollars resulted in net profit or net income. The next two are liquidity measures. Working capital and current assets take a look at the balance sheet and help assess whether the company has enough financial wherewithal to continue in the short term. And the last two are also liquidity ratios. The accounts receivable turnover ratio takes a look at the collection patterns. Just like if your paycheck was delayed, when a company has a slowdown in their collection of accounts receivable, they have more trouble paying their bills. Finally, the inventory, which is also a liquidity measure, takes a look at how quickly the company is moving their inventory. Why is this important? Because if the company's not moving their inventory, then they're not generating the accounts receivable and that has a negative effect on their cash flow. Let's take a look at each one of these in more detail. As a precursor to our discussion on interpreting financial data, remember that interested parties analyze the financial statements not only to evaluate the results of operations, but also to make decisions. You can't do this in a vacuum. You need to have an understanding of the business, the industry, and the environment in which the business operates. 
So these aren't hard and fast rules, rather they're just a little intro to the type of analyses that one would do prior to investing in a company. The gross profit percentage reveals the amount of gross profit from each sales dollar. It's calculated by dividing the gross profit by the net sales. For the company in your textbook, Whiteside Antiques, the gross profit found on the income statement was $219,030, and the net sales also found on the income statement was 549,150. When these two are divided, the gross profit margin of approximately 39.9% was generated. The net profit percentage re reveals the amount of net income from each sales dollars. It's calculated by taking the net income on the top and the net sales on the bottom. Again, this information can be found on a company's income statement. Now that we've taken a look at some profitability ratios, let's turn our focus to the balance sheet and take a look at some liquidity numbers. Working capital is the difference between the current assets and the current liabilities. As you've heard me mention, this number is not too helpful to me because what works for my small little firm might not be adequate for a firm in a, the same industry but a different size. Instead, the current ratio puts all companies on an equal level playing field. In this book, the working capital for the firm given is approximately $52,000. The current ratio is 2.14 to 1. This means that for every dollar in current debt, this company has $2.14 in current assets with which to pay it off. A benchmark is generally in the area of 2 to 1. Once again, these two ratios help measure liquidity. All of these numbers can be found on the classified balance sheet. Two more liquidity measures. The accounts receivable turnover is a measure of how well the company collects their accounts receivable. A company needs to collect accounts promptly to minimize the amount of working capital tied up in receivables and to improve cash flow. The accounts receivable turnover measures the reasonableness of the accounts receivable that are outstanding. It is also used to estimate the average collection period. This ratio is computed by taking the net credit sales on the top and dividing by the average accounts receivable. There are many ways to compute an average. Check out your textbook for an easy way to do it. The last one we're taking a look at is the inventory turnover. The inventory shows the number of times that inventory is replaced during the accounting period. It's computed as shown with cost of goods sold on the top and the average inventory shown on the bottom. Again, there's lots of ways to compute an average. Check out your textbook for a quick and easy way. Well, it's hard to believe our journey has come to an end. It's been a fast-paced semester. This is Professor Johnson. I love the journey. I'm officially, one more time, signing out.